So it's a real pleasure uh, as the executive director to sort of top and tail the, the Outlook conference. I'm going to break uh, for just a second to, to uh, remind you all uh, that you're going to be given opportunities to provide uh, feedback. Um, and we really want frank and fearless. Tell us what you liked. Tell, you, tell us what you missed. Tell us how we might do it, do it even better because uh, the whole purpose of these uh, two days is for you. And so if it's not working for you uh, and people like you or people uh, you think might be interested, uh, we really want to know so we can lift our game. So but I'm going to talk about um, sort of the consequences of the, of the uh, story uh, that Carl's just been uh, laying out, um, <coughs> both uh, it, what we've observed and, and what might be coming. So Australian farmers uh, manage significant risk, and it's not just uh, climate. Uh, there's lots of different types uh, of risk, uh, including things like succession planning and those sorts of things. Um, uh, but the, the key point here is that we know that farms, uh, agriculture, fisheries and forestry are uh, particularly affected um, by volatile prices, that's common around the world, uh, and by uh, volatile seasonal conditions. Uh, and it's that second one uh, where Australia is special in exactly the way you hope not to be special. So looking at what's changed, uh, ABES has been developing uh, new and improved modelling capacity. A few years ago, we published uh, some work uh, led by Neil Hughes uh, on the, the impacts of uh, climate variability uh, uh, on cropping farms. Uh, and we're now, we're, we'll soon be publishing work that updates that to cover all broadacre sectors. And this is a, a preview of that. So this tells you, uh, in a sense, the ratio between downside risk uh, and upside risk in, in farming uh, for, for these sectors, uh, just looking at the climate risk, so the direct climate impact. And then you add on to that uh, the combined climate and price risk. Uh, and so it's, it's a pretty substantial increase in risk uh, over the last 21 years. Uh, so that's not just what's happening in the rainfall, this is the translation of what's happening uh, to farm income. Um, and it's important to note that uh, our research indicates through the millennium drought, um, uh, uh, productivity growth paused uh, or slowed uh, as farmers uh, got a handle on managing climate risk, and since then they've been improving. So the productivity trend isn't quite as strong as it used to be, but, but all the things I'm talking about here is the residual. So after you've done that improvement, this is still how much sort of the climate pain is coming. So, so this is the, the distribution of, in a sense, a mythical average broadacre farm, so it has sort of a weighted proportion of cropping and livestock and mixed and sheep, um, but, but it gives you a good picture. So it's a, it's a fairly neat standard sort of distribution, but what's happened uh, is it's shifted uh, in the wrong direction. So, so downside risk, you're about 12%, 10% or 12% more likely to have a bad year uh, than you used to. Uh, and uh, average income, which is essentially the peak of that curve, uh, has shifted uh, about 5% uh, for that mythical weighted average farm. For cropping farms, uh, it's shifted about 10%, uh, but livestock is less, less affected. Um, so we're getting this, this shift. We're improving our risk management, uh, but the climate is making life harder and makes climate risk management more important. So again, when you look at the distribution, uh, you can see as you'd expect, the cropping areas uh, are particularly affected, but it's not a, a fully uniform story. There's a fair bit of areas which, on average, are, are, are average. Um, but then if we look at just last year, um, you see that it's... Uh, and again, I want to emphasise this is the impact on income, farm income, after all the improvements in management. So there's quite large areas uh, of the country that are uh, affected. Um, <coughs> Uh, by, by the climate uh, story. So that's the backstory. That's, that's the situation we face. That's, in a sense, our exposure to risk. Um, uh, farmers have lots of tools. They've got lots of practice and they've got lots of incentives. <coughs> Most of those tools uh, are either on farm about uh, how they manage uh, their uh, arrangements um, 
and there's a handful of off-farm uh, tools, especially uh, for smaller farms in, uh, for uh, off-farm income, um, uh, but, but more widely. I've already talked about that, so I'll skip over that. So <laughs> this is a slide that we used at the, at the drought summit in October, um, showing that it, for, uh, uh, as Carl just said, uh, the recent drought, though more um, uh, a smaller area uh, of the country affected than in some of the large major droughts uh, over recent years, um, uh, uh, has been severe. Um, but the interesting story there is the economic impact of that drought is much smaller than it would have been if that drought had occurred 15 or 20 years ago. Now, some of that is luck. So luck like good global prices that Australia doesn't have much to do with it. But a lot of that is improved productivity in the sector and improved um, techniques and, and habits. Um, and it plays in part off a general trend towards uh, better, stricter control of inputs. Uh, so a lot of the productivity growth, particularly in cropping, but not only in cropping, uh, is driven by um, stingier, more precise, um, fussier use of inputs to get the same output. Um, and that, that really helps when you're managing risks because you haven't spent as much money um, uh, if your revenue then doesn't come together. So this was the scorecard that we gave um, <coughs> for, the, uh, for the October summit, which is just comparing across and making that point uh, in the bottom line was the key point uh, that productivity is up 15% um, over the last sort of decade and a half um, once you take into account the shift in climate change. So, so that's the sort of the scorecard of which things are, are good luck uh, on the price side and which things are, are good management. But where do we go from there from a policy perspective? So ABES is a professionally independent um, uh, organisation. It's a great luxury uh, as a uh, people employed in the public sector uh, to be able to say what you really think. Um, and it's, it's crucial uh, for a, a lot of our work. So we go and collect data and we ask people, you know, really nosy and intrusive questions about management practices and how much money you make and all those sorts of things. Uh, and when an ABS person comes, you, you know we're independent. We're not out there. We're not leaking your data to the tax office or something. Um, but in terms of... Uh, the policy assessment, the first thing you think about is, is how does agriculture compare to other sectors? Uh, and so what sort of special provisions uh, does agriculture need? Uh, so this is um, <coughs> uh, data from, uh, from the Australian Farm Institute, from Mick uh, which demonstrates quite clearly that agriculture faces uh, a great deal of uh, more volatility uh, than other sectors, even uh, some quite, quote, volatile sectors. So construction, for example, is, is really strongly affected by the business cycle, uh, but agriculture puts construction in the shade in terms of volatility. But the evidence indicates that you know, farmers manage that risk extremely well. So this is uh, exit rate. It's a fairly brutal measure uh, of how well you manage risk. You know, does your business go extinct? Um, and uh, uh, agriculture is right at at the right end, at the, at the end with low exit rates, high stability uh, relative to, to the rest of the sector. Um, and the, the sectors that are bigger uh, than agriculture would have a much larger average size of enterprise. So, and so they would have some natural protection. So, so it's a risky sector, but it's managing risk well. And part of the reason for that is that uh, farms have very high equity um, farm households have much higher average wealth uh, than uh, Australian households in general. So, so there's some of the contextual factors in the background there. Now, over the last 20 years or so, <coughs> particularly since 1991, uh, which is more than 20 years, uh, Australian governments, plural, in partnership uh, with the sector, particularly leadership of the sector, uh, have done a lot of hard work uh, on drought policy and, and the stance on risk management to move away from a past tradition of attempting to drought-proof or insulate farmers from volatility. Uh, this was a part of a wider sweep of change and reform in policy 
you know, moving away from statutory marketing boards and those sorts of things. And the, and the guiding principle, the guts of it, the essential bit of that policy uh, is to separate household support from farm business assistance. And the reason to do that is to promote resilience and self-management of risk, to give people the tools and the incentives uh, to get out and do it themselves, which recognises that, you know, the only people who can manage the risk effectively, the only people who have the information to do that uh, are the farm sector uh, and the farm sort of business ecosystem of, of various forms of, of support and advice and so forth around the farm sector. It's crucial to long-term productivity growth, uh, not, because of, not only because of things like uh, increases in farm scale, but it's, it's the adoption of technology. It's the location of businesses. You know, it's <clears throat> should we, uh, you know, move to Tasmania uh, to grow our wine uh, or enjoy somewhere with a cooler climate or, or whatever it is. So you've got to have that, that flexibility. You've got to have uh, decision making uh, located without inf interference, uh, uh, at, you know, at the farm kitchen table. Um, so it's a very constructive evolution. <coughs> uh, government provides very significant support. So. This is Commonwealth government only. It doesn't uh, account for, for state government support. Uh, and it's the, in its a sense, it's the real budget cost of that support. Uh, and so in a chart here, um, in the middle, you've got the, the regional investment corporation, 7.1 million. That's not the value of the loans uh, it gives out. That's the, the cash value of the concessional finance and the admin of the scheme, for example. So, so this is the real cost. 90% of all the assistance comes through these tax concessions, which are specific um, to the, uh, to the uh, agricultural sector. Uh, farm management deposits uh, takes the cake um, at 500 million, half a billion dollars uh, per year. Um, <clears throat> and the, the ones that often get in the, uh, in the paper, in the middle ones, farm household allowance, uh, and the counselling service uh, are relatively minor contributors. So whenever Australia goes into drought, you'll read a whole bunch of stuff uh, in the papers, um, not all of it saying the same thing. Uh, some will be talking about, you know, uh, poor unsuspecting farmer uh, now in trouble. Um, some of that's not very good for our, our national brand or the reputation of the sector. Uh, and amongst that, you know, give it a week and then you'll have some uh, economists uh, coming out and saying, we really shouldn't be helping farmers at all. At all. We should be adopting this sort of Darwinian approach, uh, survival of the fittest. Uh, I've got some sympathy for that. But if, if you look at what's going on, so farm, uh, sorry, farm household allowance um, uh, is essentially giving people access uh, to the equivalent of new start payments, unemployment benefits. Uh, even the Business Council uh, says that unemployment benefits are too low and they should be increased. So it's, it's important, it's a whole lot better than nothing, but it's not hugely generous. Uh, and the, the eligibility criteria for that assistance uh, are a bit more relaxed uh, than if you're one of the undeserving poor, uh, so if you're uh, unemployed. Now there are good reasons for those different criteria uh, so if you just applied the normal assets test, anybody who's owning and running a farm uh, would be excluded. So, you know, it'd make it really easy to administer, um, but it'd rather spoil the point of the policy. So, so there are good reasons for that different treatment. Um, uh, but we know from, from publicly available information that at the moment there's about uh, 2,000 uh, households um, uh, who, are, uh, uh, who are receiving farm household allowance, and over the last... I think it's five years since the program started, it, it, it's almost 8,000 people altogether, uh, or 8,000 households. So, so it's an important and legitimate form of assistance. Uh, it's consistent with Australian community values, but given the things I've just talked about, the size of it, that it's time limited, you can't receive it forever, uh, you can only receive it uh, for four years cumulatively, um, it, it's unlikely to be doing a lot of economic harm. But there is room for improvement, and we highlight sort of two, two things. So, <clears throat> as I've just said, uh, assistance to households uh, is important and legitimate, 
Uh, those aspects are unlikely to be reducing uh, productivity growth and performance, um, but, but we need to be ever watchful in this space. So we've come a long way on the reform journey, but we're not there yet. So there are some remaining areas of business assistance rather than household assistance. So concessional finance is probably the, the starkest and clearest example of that. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a sec. But we need to be very careful uh, in assessing those and thinking about their case and, and what the options might be. Another form, in a sense, of business assistance, so it's not available to corporates, it's only available to individuals in the tax system, is farm management deposits. Uh, the shaded area shows the value of farm management deposits, uh, which now is, is comfortably north of $6 billion. Um, and the red line tells you um, sort of the net change year on year. Uh, and if you look really carefully, you'll discover there's three years uh, since they've been around um, that the value of farm deposits has fallen. Okay? If this tool was being used solely or primarily for risk management and smoothing out income over the, the client variability or seasonal conditions, you'd expect withdrawals to be roughly equal to deposits. So even as the scheme matures and you get an upward slope, you'd expect larger withdrawals. So that suggests that there's a fair bit of uh, tax preferred saving going on in the, the farm management deposit scheme. I don't think that would be a surprise to anybody in the room. Uh, if the policy purpose of farm management deposits is only and solely to manage risk, then we're probably not getting very good money, value for money from it. Um, but it probably has other purposes and it's in, um, but just in terms of where we would look if we're looking for uh, improved per policy performance, we'd be looking at those forms of business assistance and where you might go. So what are the priorities for going forward, apart from making sure that we're spending our money or our taxpayers' money wisely? Um, <coughs> it's really important to have attractive uh, insurance products so people can manage uh, off-farm risk. So we've seen, in a sense, a relaunch of multi-crop multi-peril crop insurance in Australia. Uh, it addresses some of its previous uh, problems with, it, with attracting an audience. And um, <clears throat> I, as an individual, think there's, it's, we will we'll see that uh, product grow and, and more uptake. Uh, but that's only useful uh, for, for cropping enterprises and organisations. Um, we think there's significant potential to develop uh, index insurance products. Uh, which is a, effectively uh, taking a bet on climate risk. Uh, and they're very useful because once you've paid your premium, you've sort of assessed it, um, if that event happens, if the event covered by the policy happens, you just get paid out. And so it's much simpler to operate. You don't need to demonstrate damages and so forth. The person selling you the product in the first instance decides whether they want to sell it to you. And then if the event happens, you get the payout. Um, so those index products would be very... Uh, useful and be better to have those available. Uh, and I'll comment that at the moment, uh, with you know business assistance measures such as concessional finance, the government doesn't really have very many options, so it can't achieve those policy goals in in other ways. And if we um, invested in developing these sorts of on-market uh, policy options, you'd expect to see the perceived need for those other interventions uh, to to decline. So that would be a win-win. The other big things is obviously we need improved uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, they're improving already. Uh, we'd like them to improve more and faster. Uh, so that's clearly uh, worth a support. You know, accurate. If you think about uh, today's forecasting uh, products uh, compared to 20 years ago, they're, they're hugely more uh, relevant and important and reliable. Uh, and we need to continue that journey. And the last priority is not to lose sight the main gain, to continue with the productivity reforms, um, <coughs> to, to make sure uh, for the whole supply chain uh, we're not getting in the way. So that means not just on farm before the farm gate, but freight, logistics, policy settings, uh, assurance, traceability. There's a whole bunch of things where policy needs to uh, support the best outcomes uh, for the sector as a whole. Thanks very much.